And with that, uh, I'm delighted to be here today and uh, look forward to, to questions. Thank you. Thank, I'd like to thank all our panelists for some very rich presentations. I think we've heard uh, powerful recommendations for the coordination of international inputs in this situation, uh, together with a warning from Andrew in particular about the practical difficulties of accommodating different uh, systems in our own countries. We haven't heard quite so much uh, of how to interact with Sudanese parties except the defensive point that's been made that we mustn't allow scope for wedge driving between us. Uh, and so I hope that among the uh, contributions in the discussion may be a Sudanese voice or two, though I don't, on the face of it, identify many Sudanese in this, in this audience. Now, we have a few minutes for, for questions. I've already caught John's eye and uh, been given license to uh, raid your coffee and stretch time. Uh, so we'll have a little bit longer than I'd feared. I'm going to take them in bunches to make it easier for the panel and for me if you hear a question and then have a follow-up question on the same, broadly speaking, the same aspect, please raise two fingers. And I will try and give preference in that bunch to people who are on the same subject. So we have a gentleman at the back over there. Please wait for the microphone and say who you are and who, to whom you're affiliated. Yes, good morning everybody. My name is Andrea Lai and I work with Refugees International and I have a question for the representative of the EU and also USAID when it comes to the reference of the possibly half a million southerners still in the north that Professor Nassius mentioned. What is the political position in terms of helping the government of southern Sudan to accompany these people back home to the south? And I'd like to make a clarification because, uh, uh, Ms. Lindbergh, your presentation in terms of this political and humanitarian diplomatic effort to, to accompany people back in December didn't happen at all because in February of 2011, I was in, in uh, Khartoum myself with a colleague and there were 22,000 people waiting to be transported back home and they had been waiting there for at least three to four months. So I'm sorry to contradict your opinion, but the reality is still very, very difficult for those people in that area. So the question about the political position in terms of helping the returnees. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got a follow-up question in the third row, please. Yeah, good morning. Hamid from USMC Quantico. Uh, my question is regarding development in the South. And I was wondering, maybe it's, it's time for us to look at South Sudan with the trade and business lenses instead of humanitarian aid because how long we will continue having this paternalist approach. Maybe it's time to do better than that. Thank you. It's a stretch to call that a, a, a follow-up, I think, as opposed to a very good different question. I do appeal to you not to try to deceive your moderator. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there is a genuine, I hope, two fingers back there. I'll give... <coughs> Oh, sorry, full hand. In that case, the gentleman over there. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weinschaub, University of Wisconsin, Washington, Semester in International Affairs. I'd like to ask a question to uh, Dr. Pronk. You mentioned in all of the points, by the way, which were very well expressed to us, uh, the Im Im importance of a uh, Security Council mandate, but one free of Security Council procedures. I'd like you to expand about, uh, upon that, particularly since one possibility of a mandate without the procedures would be the use of a coalition of the willing, which is something you also said you have to watch against, uh, citing some shortcomings. So I wonder if you could expand about uh, what you meant with, as far as the mandate, but without, without the requirements. Thank you. I'll take one more. The gentleman with all the fingers. <laughs> On both hands. Uh, Lawrence Freeman from Executive Intelligence Review, the um, African desk. I mean, I, I think there is a very specific mission that the West could have. I don't think it's, it's carried it out at all. Uh, if you look at the refugee problem, I was over in, in Darfur. I visited three camps there in the north Darfur, outside of Al-Fashir in January. The conditions in the camps are terrible. People spending hours getting a few liters of water. 
But the conditions outside the camps are terrible. The conditions throughout the four are terrible. The conditions on the Chadian border are terrible. So the question is, and that my view, my looking at Africa, is unless you deal, the war and conflict follows fighting over resources, land and water primarily. And you can use ethnicity to build on that. Our approach from the West, which we've been totally remiss for 40 years, is why not build the infrastructure, water development, energy development, railroad development, for not only Sudan, the Horn of Africa. Sudan has 80 million acres of arable land. Why not develop that for all of Sudan, for the Horn of Africa, for the Maghrib? These kinds of great infrastructure platforms, which the West has refused to do, and this is really the way to deal with the refugee problem and the IDP problem, because as long as you have people fighting over scant resources, there's gonna be killing, there's gonna be murder, there's gonna be displacement. And I think this is what we should now do for the new Su two Sudans, is unite them together as a regional program for infrastructure development. And I think that's the failure of the West for many years. And I think that should be the mission that we adopt now for the future. Thank you very much. I'm, that's four questions. We have four panelists, so I'm going to ask them to try one each. Nancy, you get first choice. Thanks. I will address the, um, the refugee question from uh, our colleague from Refugees International. Um, I, you know, the, the big concern leading up to the referendum was that there would be um, an unmanaged flow of refugee or of, of returnees um, who would encounter um, violence, they would or, or have, um, you know, such a huge flow that the vulnerability of those people would be, um, we'd be unable, unable to meet it. Uh, there, there has been a continual ebb and flow in Khartoum as people come into <laughs> Khartoum and then leave Khartoum or as they prepare to leave. Uh, I, I think we will see a continual movement of people, certainly through July, 